Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for King Charles III, the Royal Ghostbuster with UK ghost hunter Steve Parsons. As Great Britain and the Commonwealth welcomes its new King Charles III, we'll examine some of the stories that have circulated about his fascination for ghosts. His interest may point to a much deeper interest in the paranormal and the mystical within the royal family, going back to the reign of Queen Victoria and spanning many of the generations of the oldest and greatest monarchy in the world. Uh, a little bit about Steve. Steve uh, was uh, called the gold standard in ghost hunting by the Wall Street Journal. Steve began his search for answers as a child and subsequently has spent more than 30 years as a full-time investigator of ghosts, poltergeists, haunted houses, and related phenomena. He is currently acknowledged by his peers and leading academic parapsychologists to be one of the best investigators in the United Kingdom. He is the author of two highly regarded books, uh, Ghostology, The Art of the Ghost Hunter, and Paracoustics, Sound and the Paranormal. In addition to his writing, Steve has featured uh, and contributed in many TV documentaries for broadcasters worldwide, including the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and the BBC. He has also worked as an investigator and presenter on the hit TV ghost hunting show, Most Haunted, and I'm Famous and Frightened. Uh, Steve is a co-founder of Parascience and a contributing member to the prestigious Society for uh, Physical uh, Research, founded in 1882, and is an advisor to the world's oldest ghost group, the Ghost Club, which was founded in 1862. I'd like to say a few thank yous before I officially uh, uh, introduce Steve. I want to thank uh, Ron Kolick from the New England Ghost Project for helping organize tonight's event. I want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Public Library for being the primary sponsor for tonight's event. And I want to thank some of my library friends in North Andover, Groveland, Atkinson, New Hampshire, Hopkinton, North Reading, Raleigh, and Danvers. And I hope I didn't miss any uh, for helping uh, promote tonight's uh, program. Uh, so all 120 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Steve for joining us here tonight. And Steve, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Robert, and thank you, um, all of the people out, th out there in virtual webinar land um, for, for inviting me. And I'm very pleased to present tonight's talk. You'll have to excuse any technical glitches because um, I'm still kind of learning this new technology, the, the dark arts of uh, the Zoom webinar. And I was all set up to, um, so I have to use an iPad and I don't have like multiple screens and uh, not much screen real estate. So uh, I will appear using my camera at the end uh, for the Q&A. Um, oh, the title, um, I thought appropriate following the recent death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The talk uh, had been something that had been kind of in the back of my mind for, for a number of years. And it just seemed uh, an appropriate time to pay an homage to the royal family, to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and Britain's new king, King Charles III, who was once, as, you, as we'll discover later in the talk, uh, was once referred to as the Ghostbuster King. I apologise for any noise in the background. Um, I think there's some Harleys going up, up and down the street outside. Okay, so without further ado, uh, this my my adventures with the royal family, my my interest um, starts back in two thousand and nine, um, and I received a telephone call from a journalist whom we'll we'll just call her Jill. Jill was working for one of Britain's um, national daily newspapers and was researching an upcoming article for their Sunday supplement magazine uh, about some of Britain's lesser known stately homes and manor houses, and in particular the ghost stories um, of, these, of these properties. She asked if I knew of a Chavenage house. She told me it was located near to Tetbury in Gloucestershire, and apparently it had been featured in a number of films and television programmes, including, for example, Paul Dark, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, and a particular favourite of mine, a comedy uh, period drama locks rise to Candleford. I told her that you know I 
I knew the programmes, but I didn't know much, if anything at all, about the location. I'd certainly never been there. Well, would you like to join me there tomorrow night to spend the night and help you look for the ghosts that are supposed to haunt it? Sorry, it's a bit short notice, Jill said to me. Well, I'm never one to refuse the opportunity to search a new location for ghosts, especially somewhere quite so prestigious, and I happily accepted spending the remainder of that day packing uh, the ghost hunting kit, a few essential items, in, so that I was ready to set off bright and early the following morning for the four hour drive from where I live in West Wales uh, to Chavenage in Gloucestershire. When I got there, I followed the winding entrance driveway until through the trees, I saw Chavenage House for the first time. As instructed, I ignored the signs to the public car park, the tea rooms, and the entrance to the Hall's Gardens, and pulled up outside the Hall's Elizabethan entrance. The door to the Hall opened even before I could knock, and I was greeted by a bright, pleasant woman in, in her middle years. She introduced herself to me uh, as Caroline Lowesley Williams, but told me that I should call her Caroline. And would I like some tea after my long drive? We wound our way through the hall into the bright modern family kitchen and sat at the table while two large Labrador dogs bounded over to greet and sniff me curiously. And as Caroline poured the drinks, she told me that I was the first to arrive and that Jill had called ahead to say that she was being delayed by heavy traffic and would arrive in a little while. Well, after a few minutes of pleasant chat, uh, Caroline explained that she needed to go across to the stables, but said that I, would, I was now free to wander around the hall and the adjacent family church, and that she would find me wherever I was um, a little later when she returned. And she also added that her father, David, was somewhere about, and that he would be delighted to answer any of the questions I may have, uh, and would probably also love to show me around the, the house. Well, after Caroline left, I finished up my drink and I walked back the way I'd come through the winding um, corridors, intending to return to the car to pick up a camera. In the hall, I met her father, David, who greeted me warmly and said to me, ah, you've probably come about our ghosts. Over the next two hours, myself and David Lowesley Williams wandered from room to room as he recounted stories of the family and the history of the house with some obvious pride and great delight. Chavenage House was, was built, as, as he told me, around 1564 by Edward Stevens. And since that time, it has only been owned and occupied by two families, except for a brief period during World War II, when it was requisitioned for use by American troops, who used it as accommodation and as a training base prior to the Normandy landings in 1944. David also told me that the Stevens family sold the house in 1891, and since that time it has been owned by his, the Lowesley Williams family. At the time of my visit, the occupants included Caroline, whom I'd met, her husband, uh, who was away in London uh, at a meeting, her mother and her father, David. Uh, both children were away at school, and as I said, the, her husband was away in London on business. Built of Cotswold stone, the Elizabethan house has been much enlarged as additions were made by succeeding generations of the family, of the two families. In the extensive grounds are a number of working farm buildings and the house sits adjacent to its own magnificent family church, which is still in regular use. The estate is open to the public and the family run a small tea room and gift shop in order to supplement their income from the farm. One of the most notable events in Chavenage's history took place during the English Civil War. Nathaniel Stevens, the owner at the time, was the local member of Parliament and a supporter of Parliament in its war against King Charles I. Oliver Cromwell, the leader of the par Parliamentarian Army and later the Lord Protector of England during the brief period uh, England was a Commonwealth, was a frequent visitor to the house. Following the trial of King Charles I, Nathaniel was in favour of executing the king, although he himself was not a signatory 
to King Charles's death warrant. And it's said that soon after the king's execution, he was filled with remorse for his part in the killing of the king. It is said, it is now said that on the evening of his own death, the ghost of Nathaniel was seen leaving the house in a coach driven by a headless horseman wearing the garb of the hapless, headless king. Nathaniel Stevens is just one of Chavenage's ghosts, which has been described by some as being one of the most haunted house in the Cotswolds district of Great Britain. And as we wandered around the house, David Lowesley Williams mentioned that he was, at the time, the present Lord Lieutenant of Gloucester, in effect, making him the highest ranking public official in the entire county. Although this was, in reality, a symbolic title, but periodically he would be called upon from time to time to represent the monarch in se any ceremonial affairs that took place inside the county. While we were touring the house, we were eventually joined by Jill, who arrived flustered, complaining about the traffic and her long journey from London. As Jill had an article to write, I left her bombarding David with questions, uh, whilst also furiously writing down notes in her journalistic uh, shorthand. And as it was still a warm and pleasant day, I went outside to view the church with its spectacular stained glass, or perhaps to catch a glimpse of the ghostly priest that David had mentioned had been seen from time to time inside the church. When I returned, Jill asked how I thought we should go about hunting for the ghosts. And we discussed some of the rooms that may be of particular interest. We had a number of ghosts to choose from. One of the guest bedrooms in particular was supposed to be the most haunted room in the building. An account of the haunting was written down many years before our visit by Mrs. George Lowesley Williams, who was a lady in waiting to Princess Mary Louise, one of the granddaughters of Queen Victoria. While Princess Mary Louise lay sleeping, Mrs. Lowesley Williams was sitting doing some needlework when she became aware of an elderly lady silently standing in the room. There was no noise as the old lady moved towards the sleeping princess, bending over as if to peer more closely at the sleeping form, seemingly studying her. Then the figure stood up and gradually it faded from view. The identity of this ghostly visitor has never been determined. Perhaps, possibly, it was just some long deceased former occupant of Chavenage taking an interest in their illustrious visitor. Uh, who was asleep in the bed. We decided that this would be Jill's room, although the historic and somewhat rickety nature of the bed itself meant that she would have to endure a night on a camp bed with a sleeping bag, whilst I was to remain alert and awake with a camera at the ready. As the afternoon gave way to the evening, we made our preparations. Jill had by now interviewed several members of the family and several workers um, who worked as tour guides around the property regarding their own ghostly experiences, together with some interesting snip snippets and tidbits for her readers. Meanwhile, I had been busy setting up several video cameras and sound recorders, should one of the ghosts decide to honor us that night with his presence. After I'd completed setting up the final camera, which was covering the stair, where another of the ghosts was said to appear, Caroline arrived and asked if I would like to join the family for a bite to eat in their kitchen. I was I, I happily accepted and was informed that she hoped I wouldn't mind, but one of their neighbors had heard of our visit and had expressed an interest in coming over to have a chat with us over supper. I was more than happy to agree because, you know, after all, I'm happy to talk about ghosts with anybody. So at the appointed time, I headed into the kitchen and Caroline, both of her parents were there already, together with the two Labrador dogs I'd met earlier and now several Spaniels who were sniffing at me with interest. And as we made small talk, there was a knock at the outside kitchen door to which Caroline shouted, come in, it's not locked. 
The door opened and in walked Charles, who was then the Prince of Wales. He nodded a greeting to each of the family, then turned to me. And even before I could speak, I, mean, I was actually still trying to figure out how, what, how, I, how do I address it? Is it your Royal Highness, sir? Do I bend? Do I prostrate myself on the floor? He looked at me and he went, ah, oh, you must be the ghost hunter. I'm delighted to meet you. Please call me Charles, which took up most of the sting and the pressure off me. For the next hour and a quarter, the Prince of Wales and I sat with other members of the family talking about some of the places and the cases that I had visited and investigated. The Prince informed me that his grandmother, the Queen Mother, had often claimed to see ghosts at her family home of Glam's Castle and also within Buckingham Palace. To me, the Prince of Wales seemed to have more than a passing interest and appeared well versed in the paranormal. And some of the questions he were asking gave, uh, gave me the impression of definite insight. We talked about the methods that are employed in the search for ghosts. We talked about the rationale behind the use of equipment. And we, we shared some yarns and stories. If I sound a little reticent, eventually he said that he needed to leave, but suggested that I might be interested in looking into some of the ghostly reports that related to Highgrove, which I then realized was the estate which bounded Chavenage. Charles was the neighbor, this closest neighbor. And according to Caroline, later the, she told me that the prince would actually regularly drop by to chat about their shared interests especially related to farming as he left charles said to me that i should contact his personal secretary to arrange something and then bid us good night to my eternal regret i have never followed up on that invitation but perhaps it's a british thing because when we often say to people we mean oh if you're ever in the area do drop by and say hello, sometimes hoping that we never set eyes on the person ever again. More, many years later, I met a former secretary to the Prince of Wales, who wryly told me that when a member of the royal family makes such an invitation, it's not really an invitation. They expect you to follow it up. That's say level. During our conversation, Charles mentioned several incidents that involved leading members of the British royal family, but Privacy and protocol dictates that I got to consider much of that conversation to have been private. In addition, I also overheard Caroline say to Jill uh, on more than one occasion that she must not include any mention of our supper guest that night when writing her article. Although I'm bound by, by my honour to keep what we said that evening confidential, I think that the King's interest in the paranormal is sufficiently well known uh, that it might be appropriate to delve a little deeper this evening into why he is apparently so interested and well-versed in the subject. Whatever the royal, what, whatever the royal family discuss behind closed doors, particularly relating to the paranormal, they maintain the highest standards of discretion in public, but occasionally, by complete accident, they may let something slip that gives the rest of us a window and insight. Just such an occasion was the visit of the Prince of Wales to a London orphanage, which he made in March 1980. Among the assembled spectators was a group of people wearing lapel badges that said, healing is the gift of spirit. As Charles went through his usual routine of handshaking, one of, the lapel, one of these lapel badges caught his eye. Are you a spiritualist, he asked the wearer. Yes. How lovely, said the prince. Do you know of a Mr. Fricker? I am reading his book. It is really quite amazing. The prince then turned to Mrs. Jean Bassett, a spiritualist medium who was also with the group and joked, there's a lot of you about. Quite spontaneously and accidentally in that short exchange, Charles had revealed several personal features about himself. Firstly, by immediately recognizing the lapel badge, he had shown a familiarity with the spiritualist movement. 
He also admitted to reading a book written by Mr. Edward Fricker, a well-known spiritualist and spirit healer who was practicing in London at that time. The royal fascination with the occult, however, may actually go back many years, certainly long before any interest Charles may have had. Queen Victoria is often said to have participated in seances, both before, but especially following the death of her beloved husband, Prince Albert, the Prince Consort. Charles's grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was said to have come from a family, many of whom had well-developed psychic abilities. And there is persuasive evidence that she had, on a number of occasions, seen apparitions in her childhood home of Glam's Castle. Besides anything Prince of, the Prince of Wales may have mentioned, one of, our, one of her biographers reported an incident which occurred during World, World War I, whilst the future Queen Consort was a young girl. One day, news arrived that the future Queen Mother's brother, Michael, had been killed in France. Her elder brother, Fergus, had already been killed. Upon learning of the loss of a second brother, the family gathered at their London home of Clarence House. Among those present were the future queen, queen Mother and several of her family, including her younger brother, David, who was at the time too young to join the army and fight. David had been sent home from school upon the news of Michael's death being received. And as the family sat down to dine, David arrived at the table, not dressed in the dark suit and black tie of mourning, but instead wearing colourful evening attire. The family asked him why he was so inappropriately dressed so soon after the death of his elder brother. And he replied, but Michael is not dead. I have seen him twice. He is in a big house with fir trees all around it. He is not dead. But I do think he must be very ill because his head is wrapped in bandages. I know he is alive for I have seen him twice. Two months later, news came through that Michael was indeed alive. And the details of David's vision were also confirmed. Michael was being treated in a French military hospital surrounded by a pine forest. He had received a shrapnel wound to the head and had been rendered unconscious and had lain in a coma for several weeks with his head heavily bandaged. Lady Cecilia Bowes Lyon, the Queen Mother's sister, and her step and her, her own father, Lord Strathmore, are also recorded as having paranormal experiences. Cecilia Bowes Lyon, when she was Lady Granville, described how she had been sitting one day in the chapel at Glam's Castle when she suddenly had a feeling that she wasn't alone. Upon turning around, she saw the figure of a lady attired in grey kneeling in one of the pews as if in prayer. She wrote, I distinctly saw the detail of her dress and the outline of her figure, but the sun shining through the windows also shone through her and it made a pattern on the floor. Nobody knows who she is, but several people have seen her. She is a sweet little lady who harms no one. And as I watched, she vanished and I remained for several minutes. Lord Strathmore, her father, described his own encounter, which happened one day as he walked into the chapel in order to check on a particular painting. When I turned around, there was a grey lady. She was kneeling and she was praying. I forget what my reaction is now. I think I didn't wish to disturb her devotions, and so I quietly left. One of the best examples of psychic for one of the best examples of psychic royalty, we need to consider King Charles's great, great aunt, Princess Mary Louise. She is the same person who was asleep in the bedroom at Chavenage when the ghostly woman materialized and peered at her. Just a few months before her death, she wrote an autobiography in which she set out her views on the paranormal and described several of her own psychic experiences. Princess Mary Louise had turned to spirit, spiritualism in the 1930s and used a messenger to convey messages to some of the era's most celebrated mediums, including Estelle Roberts. These 
questions mostly related to her brother, Prince Albert of Schleswig-Holstein, who had died unexpectedly in 1931. She wrote him in her biography, I do not possess second sight, nor am I a medium, but I have had some strange experiences which neither I or those who were with me at the time could explain. A brief pause while I take a sip of. Excuse me for that. As a young woman, shortly after the end of the Boer War, I believe that I was visited by the spirit of my eldest brother, Christian Victor. As I sat in the, in the sitting room, the door opened and in walked Christian Victor. I was surprised and said to him, how, but said to him how nice it was to see him. He replied that I have just came, come to see that you are all right and happy. He then sat down in a chair next to the fire and we talked for a little while before he got up and told me that now he must leave, but I wasn't to follow him downstairs. He seemed happy and well. It was only after he had left and closed the door, it dawned on me that Prince Christian Victor had been killed 18 months before and was now buried in South Africa. Princess Mary Louise also recounted another experience which occurred during a visit to Sir Ernest Wills and his wife at their home of Little Hall. Centuries earlier, Littlecote had belonged to the notorious Wild Darrell and a member who was a, one of the founding members of the Hellfire Club. The story goes that Darrell had thrown a baby onto the fire immediately after its birth to a young servant girl that he had been seducing. The princess wrote that when she arrived at Littlecote, it all seemed to be strangely familiar, a feeling that grew stronger as she was escorted around the hall by Lady Wills. She writes, we eventually came to the long gallery, which is said to be haunted by the distraught spectre of the young mother searching for her baby. Lady Wills pointed to a door and said, this is where the girl was brought into the hall. I promptly replied, no, 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 you are quite mistaken. And I pointed to a different doorway and said, this is where she was brought in. I then shut my eyes. Why? I do not know. Still, with my eyes closed, I took a step and entered a small side room where I pointed toward the fireplace and said to my hostess, this is the fireplace where the child was burned. Princess Marie Louise was the person who may have been most instrumental in introducing King Charles to spiritualism. She presented him, whilst he was still a young boy, with a book entitled Spirit Stories for Children, which she had purchased at a spiritualist sanctuary bookshop. King Charles's fascination with the paranormal not only comes from his mother's side of the family, it also seems to have been, to have been fostered, at least to some degree, within his father, Prince Philip's family also. His favourite uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten, had a significant interest in the mystic and a particular interest in UFO phenomena. And he was convinced that these represented visitors to our world from alien worlds. Lord Mountbatten was also fascinated by the theory of reincarnation. Further indications of Mountbatten's interest in the paranormal came from the editor of the spiritualist newspaper Psychic News. Um, who was called Morris Barbanel. Mountbatten was also a member of the Ghost Club, to which I am now an advisor. And through this and his many society connections, Mountbatten had met and certainly knew many of the leading mediums and the most distinguished psychical researchers of the period. His sister, the mother uh, of Prince Philip, Princess Alice, is well known for her eccentricity. And in her later years, ado she adopted the attire of a nun, but she was never a member of any religious order. And it's also said at various times, she claimed to have foreseen events to come and participated in a number of family seances. 
Her father, King George I of Greece, the great grandfather of King Charles, was a well-known spiritualist who attended many seances and sittings with Britain's, in fact, Europe's leading mediums and spiritualists, including Maurice Barbonell and Hannah Hannan Swaffer. There is a notable exception, Prince Philip. Indeed, Prince Philip seems to have deliberately adopted a contrary position. There is no doubt that Philip had an interest in UFOs, uh, and he, he, on a number of occasions, wrote uh, to ministers and to the Ministry of Defence with uh, questions pertaining to them, rather like um, Lord Louis Mountbatten had done. But Philip was a product of the era of scientific optimism. And whilst he always stressed the importance of religion and of human values, the speeches he made and in his writings, he always made it clear that he thought the destiny of the world is more likely to be settled in the laboratory rather than at the altar or within the seance room. The materialistic approach of his father may have led to points of conflict between Charles um, and, his, and his father, Prince Philip, because Charles is a deeply religious and firmly committed, a uh, deeply religious man who is firmly committed uh, to the church and also to a belief in spiritual forces. Accepting, if we accept that Philip is the exception, the fact is that the royal family maintains an interest in the paranormal. And this interest we can, with some certainty, at least trace back to Charles's great great grandmother, Queen Victoria. There is no doubt that Queen Victoria held religious views that closely resembled many spiritualist belief. And whilst there is no evidence that she was a practicing spiritualist, her letters certainly reveal that she believed in clairvoyance and psychic power, especially in matters relating to her, to her loyal uh, servant, the Scot, her Scots gilly, John Brown. She has also described that her earthly life was interpenetrated by an unseen world where the deceased continue with lives much the same as the mortal lives had been. In 1861, Queen Victoria was robbed in one year of two of her closest family mother, uh, members, her mother, with whom she did have a very difficult relationship, and shortly afterwards, her beloved husband, Prince Albert. Almost inconsolable in her grief, the Queen's thoughts turned to the afterlife. Now, many people attribute the founding of the spiritualist movement to the Fox Sisters in Hydesville, upstate New York. In 1848, they claimed to be communicating with the spirit of a dead peddler by means of rapping and tappings. So it might come as a bit of a surprise to learn that two years earlier, Queen Victoria had been experimenting with something very similar. This is evidenced by a gold watch on which are inscribed, presented by Her Majesty to Miss Georgina Eagle for her meritorious and extraordinary clairvoyance produced at Osborne House, July 15th, 1846. The term clairvoyance was first used by spiritualists to describe their ability to see into the spirit world. The word appeared for the first time in the Oxford Dictionary of 1847. And whilst the dictionary normally reflects words that are by the, that pit, um, by the time it gets into the dictionary in common parlance, it has been suggested by some that the watch may have been a forgery uh, based upon this apparent conflict of dates. Sadly, we will never know, and even more sadly, the watch is now lost because it was stolen from its glass display case during the 1960s, uh, at, where it was on display at the London Spiritualist Alliance. One of the many questions regarding Queen Victoria's interest in the paranormal relate to her alleged attempts to communicate directly with her beloved Albert. And by the time of his death in 1861, Britain was already 
well established in the grip of organized spiritualism. It became known within a small group of spiritualists that a young medium by the name of Robert Lees was claiming to be in touch with the spirit of the Prince Consort. The facts only came to light after Lee's death in 1931, when his daughter Eva wrote an account of the story. She described how the family had moved into a haunted house when their father was just a young boy of seven. As a youngster, he was able to see the ghost pointing its presence to others in the family who could not see it. Shortly afterwards, he indicated that the spirit wanted a proper burial and took family members to an unconsecrated site whereupon they dug and located the skeleton and arranged for its internment in a nearby churchyard, whereupon the haunting ceased. Several years later in 1862, a few months after the death of Prince Albert, he and members of the family were holding a seance circle within the house, trying to get a table to jump and move about. All of a sudden, Eva said, my father became sleepy and entered a trance. He announced that someone in the spirit realm wished to speak. The spirit began by saying he was Prince Albert. What Albert is supposed to have said is not known, it's not recorded, but it was of sufficient detail that one of the sitters sent a copy of the prince's words through Robert to the queen. Two weeks later, another seance was arranged, but this time there were two strangers present whom the family either did not recognize, Lees, uh, whom the family did not recognize. Lees once again channeled the apparent spirit of Albert, who directly addressed the two men. I am pleased to see you here, Lord X, and also your friend, the Earl of X. They had both come to find out if it really was the Prince Consort, Cap Prince Consort, and asked if he could write a message for the Queen and sign it with the private signature that only he had used between one another in life. The message was duly written and signed and was taken away by the two visitors. Shortly afterwards, the two men arrived once more at the Lees' home and asked if Robert would accompany them to the Queen. Over time, the family grew accustomed to the periodic arrival at the house of one or two men in a carriage to collect their father and then return him some hours later. Well, having heard or learned of Eva's story, the Reverend Barham, a member of the Society for Psychical Research, uh, commented, whether Queen Victoria communicated with Pr Prince Albert after his death, I do not know, but of one thing I am sure, his family and his daughter were absolutely convinced of the facts of their story. Little drink. It is also often claimed that Queen Victoria's Scottish ghillie, John Brown, was a medium. What is in no doubt is his close relationship to the Queen and this has led to some speculating that their relationship may have been may have gone further and become sexual. Another claim for which there is absolutely no evidence. But regarding the suggestions that Brown had acted as a medium and a point of contact be between Queen Victoria and her deceased consort, whilst there is little evidence, following Brown's own death, all of his personal diaries were impounded by the Queen's private secretary apparently destroyed. Then the Queen herself caused great consternation by announcing that she intended to publish a biography of Brown. This prompted a threat of immediate resignation by the Dean of Windsor, the Queen's personal priest, who stated that he was wary of, about the Queen's unorthodox religious ideas and their unsettling effects upon the established church in England. Following the Queen's death in 1901, every memento of Brown's existence within the royal palaces was removed, including his statue at Balmoral, his bust at Buckingham Palace, and even his commemorative plaque within the royal mausoleum. The only remaining trace of Brown was the inscription written by the Queen 
upon his headstone. It read, that friend on whose fidelity you count, that friend given you by circumstances over which you have no control, was God's own gift. Many spiritualists interpreted the dedication as possessing an explicit spiritualist context. As for the diaries, spiritualists claim that a single volume escaped destruction. And this was disclosed by the journalist we met earlier, Hannon Swaffer, in 1957, following a conversation that he had held with a fellow spiritualist, Lionel Logue, a confidant of King George VI. The context, the content of, the, of this remaining diary, we don't know. And all we know of its contents comes from the reported conversation between the King and Lionel Logue. Now you may you may um, you may wonder who Logue is, because, but he is best remembered as the King's speech therapist who helped George VI overcome his serious speech impediment, as was portrayed in the uh, film, The King's Speech. According to Logue, one day the King said, "Lionel, you're you're a spiritualist, and you know that the Queen's private secretary destroyed all the records of my great grandmother's séances." Well, we have just found one of the volumes that they overlooked, and it is very, very interesting. When Benjamin Disraeli, Queen Victoria's former prime minister, lay dying, he received a message from the Queen asking if she might visit him. It is recorded that his response was to turn to the wall and muttered, no, it is better for her not to visit. She will only want me to carry a message to Albert. Disraeli was apparently very well aware of the Queen's spiritualist leanings, and his response is entirely consistent with her religious views, whether they actually be spiritualist or not. Perhaps one unintended, one of the unintended consequences of Queen Victoria's beliefs is that her son, King, King Edward VII, became a client of Count Louis Hamon, AKA Cairo, AKA, well, his real name was William John Warner. Count Hamon was a fashionable palmist and clairvoyant throughout the capitals of Europe. And it's no secret that Edward was deeply superstitious with an intense interest in the occult and had attended a number of seances one of which took place at the London home of Lady Paget at Belgrave Square. Lady Paget was a charming American. For anybody interested, she was one of the Stevens heiresses of Chicago. In his own biography, Count Louis Hamon, John, William John Warner wrote, secrecy was the keynote of the meeting. I was told to come to Lady Paget's home on a certain evening for dinner. When I arrived, the hostess met me in the hallway and conducted me to the smoking room and told me to sit behind some curtains that had two holes cut in them. She told me I would be alone with my guest, with the guest, and that I was to speak frankly and without regard for his feelings. Eventually, someone entered the room and thrust their hands through the holes in the drapes. After giving the reading, the sitter was heard to decline to declare strange but remarkably true at that moment the sitter's hand rested too heavily upon the drape and the fastening gave way allowing the curtain to fall open hamon was looking directly at the face of edward the prince of wales as their meeting was concluded the prince of wales thanked hamon most courteously and remarked once more on the accuracy of the reading, even if it's pr the prognostications were somewhat gloomy. Leaving, the Prince of Wales said that he hoped that they would meet again. Indeed, they were to meet again once more, just before the outbreak um, of the Boer War at the Marlborough Club, where the King inquired about the Tsar of Russia and the German Kaiser. Edward VII attended many other seances with other mediums, including one with medium Jesse Shepherd, whereupon 
the king listened to music played upon a closed piano. And it also seems likely that Edward had a strong sense of foreboding surrounding his own death. The sister of Earl, of Earl Hague, who was the commander in chief of the British army, also and claimed to be a medium and warned the king of his impending death at a dinner attended by the king in January 1910. Afterwards, the king said how much the earl's sister had hurt him by conveying a warning to him. The king explained that she had told him that preparations need to be made and that time is short, a warning that proved to be unfortunately true when the king died just five months later. Psychic matters were also of interest to Edward's son, King George V. At the age of 17, while serving as a cadet officer aboard HMS Picante, he was one of several officers and ratings who witnessed a ghostly sailing ship. There are numerous accounts of this sighting written by other witnesses who were present, including an account by the King's personal tutor, the Reverend John Dalton. Writing immediately after the event, Dalton, Dalton records, I wonder if he recorded there was a Harley Davidson going past, but writing immediately after Dalton records, at about 4 a.m., the Flying Dutchman crossed our bows, a strange red light as of a phantom ship all aglow, in the midst of which we could see the spars, the masts, and the sails of a brig just 200 yards distant. The lookout on the forecastle reported the ship as close on our port bow. This sighting was confirmed by the officer of the watch and the quarter deck midshipmen. Several of the crew were sent forward at once to the forecastle, but on arriving, there was no vestige or sign of the ship to be seen. The night was clear and the sea was calm. Around 13 people altogether saw the ship. At 10.45 the same morning, the seamen who had first reported seeing the Flying Dutchman regrettably fell from the foretop and was smashed to atoms. The years following World War I were ones of intense interest in spiritualism in Britain and in North America. Many people had of course been left bereaved and there was a collective desire to communicate with lost loved ones. One spiritualist wrote a letter to King George V containing a message for the king from his mother, Queen Alexandra, who was flattered to receive a, re and was flattered to receive a, a reply, um, which was afterwards published in Psychic News. The letter, addressed from Buckingham Palace and dated February the 6th, 1935, reads, it was very kind of you to send me such an inspiring letter from my dear mother. I fully understand what she has thought fit to convey to me through your instrumentality. My mother, although deceased, is constantly with me, watching and guiding my private affairs. I appreciate her message about the dark cloud shadowing the home, but promises a happy reunion in the land of eternal sunshine. Less than a year after the reply, King George V died. There are very few indications whether King Edward VIII ever indulged in spiritualism. Edward was a materialist. Some would even go as far as to suggest that Edward was hedonistic. However, in 1978, six years after the Duke of Windsor's death, a respected medium, David Walton, revealed that in 1980, uh, 1952, whilst traveling on the line of Queen Elizabeth, Walton happened to bump into the Duke who was also traveling with his wife aboard the ship. The Duke invited him to take tea in his cabin. Afterwards, Walton and the Duke uh, said that the Duke asked if he could give him a reading. Walton kept no notes and refused to divulge the contents of the meeting, but he was given a handwritten note by the Duke thanking him and saying, God bless you and your mission in life. If there is one unusual enthusiasm which the royal family is known for, then it is homeopathy. The former Queen Elizabeth II and several leading members of the royal family were and remain regular visitors to homeopathic practitioners. And this interest in homeopathy gives us 
may give us an insight into the family's attitude to the supernatural because there is no scientific explanation for how homeopathy works or even if it works at all. But nevertheless, from Queen Adelaide in the early 1800s through her daughter, Queen Mary, Edward, the Duke of Windsor, King George VI, and many others have shown a close interest in the subject. And several, including the Duke of Gloucester, have been patrons of homeopathic hospitals. In fact, Queen Elizabeth II was known to carry with her a small box of homeopathic remedies when she traveled. And King Charles has followed closely the experimental use of homeopathic remedies on pigs and cattle at his Elm Farm Research Center. Just let the truck go, Mark. There we go. I think he's passed now. If there was one... Um, any reticence to speak openly on subjects considered as being mystical is perhaps understandable because during the 1950s, the royal family, the British royal family, received a salutary lesson in the dangers of them revealing their interest in anything so controversial. In 1956, the German magazine Der Spiegel reported that Queen Juliana of the Netherlands and her, hus her husband, Prince Bernhard, had become estranged because of a spiritual healer named Greet Hoffman. Hoffman had been introduced to the Dutch court in 1948 in the hope that he might cure the blindness suffered by Princess Marieke. In this, he failed but became highly influential over the Queen, introducing her to a number of spiritual practices. Hoffman claimed that any failure to cure the princess's blindness was entirely because of Princess Prince Bernhardt's inability to have any faith in her. In, in her. Whilst Hoffman was well known internationally, one of her fellow media, um, spiritualist Lord Dowding said of Hoffman, that she was completely selfless, he, he was completely selfless and, and dedicated. Eventually, Bernhard ordered that Hoffman should be removed from the palace and compared Hoffman to Rasputin. Queen Juliana continued to visit Hoffman. Bernhard strongly disapproved of the long conversations that took place between the two. And he felt that his wife was withdrawing from reality. The Dutch press at the time ran many stories of Queen Juliana's visits and meetings with Hoffman, where they reportedly discussed world peace through mysticism and moral rearmament. And as the stories grew increasingly bizarre, it became obvious that the Queen and the Prince were living almost separate lives. In fact, Bernhard is quoted as saying that Queen Juliana was the victim of some kind of hypnotism. Indeed, even Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of the late US president, was called upon by Bernhardt to try and make Juliana see some sense, but to no avail. Eventually, the media storm died down, but another was just about to start in 1959 when Juliana managed to persuade Bernhardt to give an official audience to George Adamski. Adamski claimed... Uh, to have had first-hand experience of flying saucers and had shaken, claimed to have shaken hands with a friendly Venusian who took him on a trip into space. In the media, there was much bewilderment that the royal couple had taken this man so seriously. Reports that Adam's uh, visit created even more family disagreement. Meanwhile, Buckingham Palace issued a statement that Adamski would most definitely not be received there. But we're going to return back to King Charles III, because in 1985, Weekend magazine carried the headline, Charles the Ghostbuster. It read, Prince Charles is a palace ghostbuster. Armed with cameras and tape recorders, he has spent nights in haunted royal rooms. Just sounds like my kind of guy. Observers say that the prince has seen the ghost of Henry VIII and is trying to contact his uncle, Lord Mountbatten, by using a Ouija board. The prince's coup with Henry VIII occurred at Windsor Castle last year, according to a friend of both Prince Charles and Princess Diana. 
With a tape recorder, thermometer and infrared camera, Charles spent a lone vigil in the alleged haunted rooms of Windsor Castle. His appetite had been whetted after learning that several palace staff revealed that they had seen an apparition in the room. The figure, the servants said, described as being overweight, bearded and wearing white breeches and a scarlet tunic trimmed with gold. They were absolutely certain that this apparition was King Henry VIII. The unknown friend of the royal couple also disclosed part of the conversation that had taken place with Princess Diana. Diana told me that Charles spent the first night in the library, but that nothing happened. But the following night, Charles had seen the Tudor King. Charles was reported to uh, have said to Diana afterwards that King Henry was close enough to touch and that the King walked slowly to and fro for almost two minutes. Charles, meanwhile, recorded the noise of the King's footsteps on his tape recorder. Now, <clears throat> the magazine, it's got to be said, is not the most reliable of sources. And the story of Charles the Ghostbuster seems somewhat at odds with a later headline in another newspaper, which claimed that King Charles had fled after seeing the ghosts of King George V whilst he was at Sandringham. Nevertheless, this can also be interpreted that the new king has had at least an occasional brush with the apparitions that haunt many of the royal palaces. Windsor, Windsor Castle, is said to contain at least five royal ghosts and a number of other apparitions. The cloisters of the castle are supposed to be the favourite spot for the spirit of Henry VIII, who was also apparently seen by two soldiers on guard duty in 1977. The apparition of Queen Anne Boleyn has also been reported peering through a window in the cloisters and walking along the eastern parapet of the castle. King Charles I is supposed, is supposed to periodically visit the Canon's House, which stands in the castle's grounds, and Queen Elizabeth I is said to haunt the Royal Library and her apparition being seen by a number of soldiers library staff and indeed members of the royal family. After the death of King George III in 1820, palace guards were surprised when his familiar face appeared at his usual window below the library, although he, at the time he himself was lying in state elsewhere within the castle. Such was the clarity of the vision that the commander of the guard, William Knollys, even gave an order to the guard of eyes right. It has been reported on several occasions that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has had more than one ghostly encounter within Windsor Castle. But quite why Windsor should be the scene of so much activity is somewhat of a mystery. We certainly couldn't conduct paranormal investigations or ghost hunts there. Some people have suggested that it lies along an ancient and great ley line, but it's not even just Windsor that has its more than its fair share of ghosts. The other royal palaces, including Balmoral, Buckingham Palace, Sandringham, Holyrood, Hampton Court and the Great Tower of London all have notable and well-documented ghost stories attached to them. Like the, each of the castles, but especially the Tower of London, have played a pivotal role in the history of Great Britain and have been the site of many bloody executions and great moments in our history. So it's hardly surprising that they abound with stories of ghosts. The other royal palaces were, and in many cases remain, family homes and places of personal sanctuary for the monarch. So perhaps the ghosts simply return for um, personal reasons from time to time. If the new king was ever, or did ever decide to become a ghostbuster, Charles certainly has no end of places to choose from uh, in order to conduct his hunts and his searches. In fact, he doesn't even have to move that far from his own haunted home at High Grove in Gloucestershire. The manor next door to Ch uh, next door, Ch uh, next door Chavenage, we've already learned from my own visit, has several ghosts. And just a few miles away from Highgrove is Gapcombe Park, the home of his sister, the Princess Royal, Anne. 
who, and this too has well attested tales of ghosts and a phantom black dog said to foretell the death and destruction of all those who witness it. It's got to be emphasized that the story of Charles, the Ghostbuster King, cannot be definitively proven, but nor can it be denied. Although there has been a, one denial made that Charles has ever dabbled with a Ouija board in an attempt to contact his uncle, Lord Mountbatten. Of one thing we can be absolutely certain, I personally can be absolutely sure, King Charles is far more interested in the paranormal than many people realise. God save the King. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That kind of concludes um, the talk itself. So we, if I switch screens, bear with me while I figure out how to uh, get through to the Q&A. There we go. And start All right. Today. So, Steve, uh, wonderful job as expected. Uh, folks, let's take uh, 10 minutes of questions. It's not every day we get to talk with a, one of the preeminent ghost hunters from the UK. So if anyone has any questions for Steve uh, regarding tonight's presentation, or even in general, way, now, now, now yeah. is the time to ask. Anything yeah. and everything, except what I said to Prince Charles. <laughs> uh, Rosamond asks, have you seen many ghosts? Have I personally seen many ghosts in, in my years of ghost hunting? Um, one or two. But the big difficulty is, um, as researchers will, will acknowledge, we don't yet know what a ghost is. So quite what we're seeing, we don't fully understand. But yes, I've, I've seen less than, I could count them on the fingers of one hand what might be described or called ghosts. Uh, Rosamond says, fascinating program, thank you. Uh, Lois says, very interesting, I loved it. William says, very fascinating, thank you. Uh, Ginny asks, have you ever taken part of a table tipping? I, I've um, had the, the good fortune to have been involved in table tipping, seances, um, and similar red light, uh, seance phenomena on 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 many many occasions uh, where can i've you, seen can you explain what table tipping is for those who don't know okay table tipping is essentially um it's kind of a parlor game that was played by spiritualists in order to demonstrate that there was spirits present and as a very crude rudimentary means of communication a group of people would assemble uh, around the table they would um, lay their hands on the table with their finger, fingertips touching and then call upon the spirits to either tilt or rock or move or uh, in extreme cases lift the table physically from the floor. Mm -hmm. um, it's, now, it's, Leslie's, oh go ahead, sorry. So say it's kind of akin to uh, the Ouija board. Ah uh, yes, yeah. Uh, Leslie says, no questions, but uh, this was captivating. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, Jan says, well done. Another great program, Steve. Johanna says, this was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, John wants to know, uh, when and how did you get interested in ghosts? Um, according to my parents, because it started at an age that I don't remember. You, you reach an age in life when um, your parents start to tell anybody that knows you, particularly my wife, embarrassing stories about you as a child. And uh, it was then that I realized, um, I, I um, discovered that I had had an imaginary friend as a child and that uh, as a youngster, I used to, on family holidays, um demand to be taken to there was a there was a particular haunted hotel and i used to demand to be taken to look for the ghosts and at around age, age eight or nine apparently with a group of friends i used to conduct seances in the family garage um i i, I genuinely have no recollection of those um but according to my my mum that was uh, that that was when I, my actual interest that I can remember started in my early teen years when I discovered in a book, um, Britain's Most Haunted House, 
and I started from there reading uh, accounts of great ghost hunters and just had an overwhelming desire to see a ghost. I, I'd read um, that they would sit on the stairs at night with a can were armed with a candle. Um, so I started to emulate uh, these ghost hunters and very quickly realized that it was not quite as e ever going to be as easy as that. And then down the years, I, I wanted to objectify my experiences. Uh, Kathleen says, thank you so much. This was very interesting. Uh, Teresa asks, what happened during your night at uh, Chavanez house? <laughs> uh, Jill slept very soundly. Um, I, I stayed awake for most of the night. Um, I heard the sound of mice and I heard the sound of the animals outside on the estate and I enjoyed a splendid breakfast and then drove home. There you go. Uh, Judith says, uh, thank you for this presentation. It was very cool. Uh, so I think we're gonna start to wind down, Steve. Let, let me ask you this question. Um, this will probably be our final question. Uh, so uh, what's next for Steve Parsons? What are you working on? Are you writing any books? Are you gonna be appearing on any more TV series? Uh, and uh, what, what are you doing in America right now? Well, I, I'm making, um, it used to be an annual visit to um, spend time with my uh, Ghost Chronicles international co-host and good friend, Ron Kolek. Um, and we, we did some, shared, we do some shared events. Uh, he has a, an excellent event at VZ Memorial Park uh, called Spirit Quest. And, um, and we, we, we just hang out and do some stuff together. Um, but of course, um, recent events, the year that shall not be mentioned um, means that there's been an interregnum since my last visit. So I'm over here primarily enjoying time with my friends, um, catching up with some of the haunted locations and doing some public speaking. Um, when I get back home, I have a research project to uh, be commence for the Society of Psychical Research. And I would just add here, um, not promoting me, <clears throat> but if anybody does have an interest in um, the paranormal that goes a little bit beyond just visiting haunted houses, or indeed if they, they spend time in haunted houses, if they were to head across to, uh, to the SPR, the Society for Psychical Research website, spr.ac.uk, uh, there are a number of membership op options, but membership gives you access to a virtual unlimited archive of resources of all of the investigations, both of haunted houses, seances, mediums, and psychical phenomena going back to 1882. Uh, some of the, we, uh, within the archive, there are samples of ectoplasm. There is fur from a, uh, from Jeff the Mongoose, for those of, who might be familiar with that case. But most importantly, for the modern um, researcher, it is a fantastic resource. Um, all of the online resources are free, but if there is any, um, they have a, a, a real uh, library. And even if you're in North America or the Australian Outback, they will post the books to you. And when you finish reading them, um, you will post them back again. So it is a fantastic resource down at spr.ac.uk. I have, uh, I've just completed two commissioned books for the SPR uh, relating to foundations of good practice for investigators, guidance notes, if you like, for investigators. And uh, I've also commenced work on a follow-up to my book, my shared book, Paracoustics, which look at sound and the paranormal. Um, and this what the follow up is Paravision, which looks at all aspects of the visual phenomena and uh, the paranormal. So that's going to keep me busy, hopefully, until I am uh, able to return to New England again.
Well, Steve, uh, when you do return, I promise to host you in person, and we'll do it. We'll do a hybrid, so we'll I'm you'll so speak in person, it. and uh, but we'll still uh, broadcast on Zoom uh, for those who can't be here uh, with you. But uh, folks, let's give Steve one last big virtual round of applause. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, the majority of the crowd stuck with us uh, past eight, so that was good to see. Uh, folks, look for an email for me tomorrow with a recording, a feedback survey, and more information about some other upcoming virtual paranormal programs. Uh, I think Tewksbury has six or seven more in the lineup uh, before Halloween, and I encourage I can't speak to London or Ecuador or whatnot, uh, but uh, I encourage you to uh, check your local libraries as well. I suspect they might be doing some Halloween themed programs also. Uh, and uh, so, Steve, thank you so much. I want to thank Ron Kolick from New England Ghost Project. I uh, want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library and want to thank the other uh, half dozen or so mass libraries uh, and one New Hampshire library uh, that helped us promote this. Steve, any and last can words? I, yep, can I just offer my personal thanks for the invitation and the opportunity sure. to uh, share what was a hastily put together but timely presentation and hopefully next time we will meet in person. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, look for that email tomorrow. Everyone have a great night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.